two, one. We are live. Yay! Hello, everyone. Hi, America. How are you doing? Welcome to the Hardware Show and to the UIA, United Inventors Association, virtual pitch session. We are so excited to be here today, literally virtually from all around the country. We have six, well, right now we have five. We're waiting for our sixth amazing entrepreneur who's going to be coming on and pitching to world-renowned panelists of judges. I have to tell you, these three gentlemen that we have today, bar none, are game changers in this industry. And game changers meaning they could change your life. They can change it in a matter of four minutes. So let's quickly introduce our panelists. We have Carmine Den Denisco. I always said that wrong, Carmine Wave. How you doing? We have Michael Miller. Michael Miller is with us today. And my very own really good friend, although all of you are my friends, Scott Hind. Um, Scott Wave. So hey, Carmine, hey. let's start with you. We're going to go Carmine. We're going to go Mike. We're going to go Scott. Tell us who you are and tell us how you're going to change lives. So Carmine did us go here. Yeah. Uh, my claim to fame is I look at many, many products, sometimes invest in them. I am an expert in short run and manufacturing. And of course, design and products and look at products to get onto store shelves all the time. Love it. Mike, tell us who you are. Hi, so I'm Michael Miller. I work for Danco and LSP companies, both part of NCH Corporation. Uh, and my primary job with the company is looking at new products from inventors and small companies and then deciding on if we're going to license those products or not. We have distribution in all of your major hardware retailers, Lowe's, Home Depot, we're in Amazon, Walmart, uh, Ace, True Value, you name it, we're, we're in those stores. And even QVC and HSN occasionally. So uh, really looking forward to seeing your products and uh, looking forward to seeing these and, and getting some good stuff here. Excellent. And throwing it over to my friend, Scott. Hey guys, my name is Scott Hind. I'm an on-air personality at QVC. I'm a product expert in their home innovations uh, area. Hard goods is what we like to call it. Uh, I've been doing that just south of 20 years. Uh, your first question is, how can someone as ugly as you be on television? It's because <laughs> I actually do know something about the products and, the, uh, and uh, nothing else. So yeah, this is what I do. I live, eat, and breathe this business. And I certainly look forward to seeing what everybody has. Oh, that's awesome. And then also with us is Kathy Keurig. She's with the UIA and she's kind of helping me keep things on track today. So my name is Dara Trujillo. I will be your moderator. I have theme park experience, home shopping network experience. I've worked with angel investors. Um, I've been on Shark Tank, so I know what it's like. I've not been the presenting side. I've been the other, but I know what it's like to pitch. And I'm, I'm sure some of the nerves are coming out right now. Um, but that's why it's important that you stick to your pitch. Tell us what your product is. We'll be excited to hear about it. And then we're going to jump in and make sure that we also give everyone time to have some incredible feedback. All right. So um, our first presenter is hopefully going to try to join us at the end of the segment. So we're going to jump in right now. Steve, you get to go first. We love the first one out of the gate. This is Steve Alpert. And his product is Doc. Woods Badass Mud. Steve, take it away. All right, how are you? I've created Doc Woods Badass Mud. It's the best uh, post protection planet on the product, on the planet. Are you ready to uh, show the video? Hello? Hey, yeah, Steve, hang on a sec. You want to share the video now, Steve? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, view it. Here we go. When they first go in, but after years, this is what you get. This Put in plaster, like video. this, concrete, and not covering the entire surface, it doesn't do any good. I'm not seeing the video. Hello? Yeah, Steve. Okay, let me, uh, let me see here. He's not seeing it, but I know yeah, that the I audience can is. See it. I can see it. Unless you want to. Yeah, you guys I saw was it? able to see it as yeah, well. I, I, we if I can't see it, I can't narrate it. <laughs> sure. Well, there's a voiceover on the video, which we can hear. Well, and use that. I mean, that does that cuts me out. It'll tell you the whole thing, but. 
Yeah, now this is the video we were going to mute, Carmine, for the first three minutes and 20 seconds. Okay. Okay. You got it. All right, let's bring it back up. But I got to be able to see it. So <laughs> I just got a spinning thing that says waiting on my screen. I see me, but I never saw any of the other people presenting. But you can hear me? We can hear you yeah. and we can see you. And we can see you. Okay. I, like I said, I'm not seeing the video, so I'm getting my screen. Been there for a half hour. All right. So can you see? This. Can you see this? this? Is what you get. Can you see this right now, Steve? What we see? I see me. You only still see you. I'm seeing me. Put in plaster. Like this. All right. Okay, I tell you what. Let's, waiting thing. Why don't we try this? Um, out of out of respect for uh, us wanting to make sure we see you and the video, and you can have visibility. Kathy, let's let him out of the waiting room. Let's let him out. And Steve, would you mind Steve coming back in? I, we will put you next. We'll go ahead and jump on to our next presenter. But we're all we're going to do is have Kathy let you out of the meeting. So you'll hit leave meeting. And then Steve will have you come back in. You'll join back in. And by that time, okay. hopefully you can see everybody. And then we'll start your presentation when you get back in after we have done our next presenter, who's going to be Ralph. All right. Great job. Okay. All right. So with that, are you ready, Ralph? Are you ready to, to take it over? Because we are ready when you are. Your product is called the Smoke Detector tester ready when you are i'm ready uh, first of all let me start by saying thank you to the panel for allowing me to pitch my my product in front of you uh but let me start also by saying i'm i'm, jo I'm just joe lunch bucket a guy who's come up with a tool a low-tech tool for, for solving a high-tech problem and that high-tech problem is um testing smoke detectors in uh, areas where there's difficult to reach such as inside hvac ductwork um data center subflooring and print up air spaces. So if you can show the 15 second video I've sent you uh, so the panel can see it and I can, they can get a good idea as to what I, that's uh, that's the way they're doing it now with a orange bottle and see it taking two technicians and so, so the first picture was really kind of antiquated and, and what you see there is what I've created. So if you could stop the video now, that's that's great. They got a good idea. So essentially, I've I've developed a tool for testing. Uh, this is a, this is a three D print. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see it? No. Ralph, if you with bring your tool like closer to oh, my, my, my my virtual background is is, is got yeah, you. Yeah, bring well, it up anyway. close to the screen. Bring oh, okay. it up close to the screen. Well, so let me start. Let's see. Uh, uh, well, can you show the sell sheet? Can no, you actually, if you bring the product basically closer to your face, uh, there you go. Now we're able to see it. Okay. Okay. So, so essentially, it's a tool for testing smoke detectors in in, in difficult to reach locations. Like I said, inside uh, data center subflooring, plenum air spaces, and inside HVAC ductwork. Currently, there's not a tool on the market that performs that task. Um, and it's a labor saving device. And it'll also conserve uh, test smoke aerosol. And um, it's a product that's, that could be used, is that, that, would, that would definitely be used for inspecting and in testing smoke detectors uh, during commissioning the for live fire life safety systems. And also uh, I, I own the patent on it. Oh, I, I, this, this, is, this is the patent. It's, I, I, I own the patent. Well, that's not quite, that's not quite uh, true. There's another person in my life that has a stake in the patent. That would be my wife. <laughs> Ralph, let's be honest. She owns it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, you guys, she has a big stake in it. And so um, essentially what I'm looking for is a, is a partner to commercial, com commercialize, uh, a commercialize, commercialization partner to uh, bring this uh, idea to market. Um, I would really like to license it. Uh, and that's that's been my goal. Uh, the license, the the patent was issued in 2017, and I've been pounding the payment ever since, trying to get it out there. And so, if I can, that, that's that's essentially what I have is a tool that 
I believe that the fire life safety industry could definitely use. And uh, I have some fire protection engineer friends that's been waiting on it to come to market. And I've just been, I've been working my tail off trying to get it out there. And I've, I just haven't had much success in, in recent years. Okay, wonderful, great pitch, um, really great product. Let's go over to Michael. Michael, um, you see lots of hardware tech kind of products. What, what do you think? Would love to start with you for feedback. Absolutely. Well, Ralph, great presentation. Uh, I like the concept behind your product. You're right. There isn't anything out there currently. Uh, everybody has all these sort of made up tools that they've been using. I'm assuming that yours has that. Uh, they use the smoke can that goes inside and yours is a press button, almost like a paint gun type of thing. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you're going to have a few options with this, but really where this product would sell is for the professionals that do that type of testing. Um, it's not as much of a homeowner's pro you know, type of product, although it could be, but really you're, the vast majority of your sales are going to be through the uh, distributors that really do fire appliances and fire testing and that type of thing. And that's really where you probably need to really, um, you know, focus your efforts, uh, I would say. And, and, you know, especially if you're looking for licensing, that would be who I would look at going with. Uh, and a number of those companies are open to, to new innovation and, and that type of thing. Great, Carmine. What do you think? Yeah, so um, good, good, pre good pre presentation for what we're working with. I think it was awesome. Um, real quick question: Are there any certifications that are involved in this type of product? Not that I know of. Um, I ha I've been looking for certs. I tried to um, get a hold of the California State Fire Marshal's office to see if they did any type of certification. Uh, they do not. Um, there are manufacturing certifications that are out there, um, but I don't know of any industry standards that uh, require it, not unless I went with a, a UL type of certification, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, have, you had, uh, have you had anybody- Carmine, I can, oh, I go can ahead. help you with go that ahead, one Mike. just a little bit. It, it, it actually, you can get, they would have to write a new UL certification specifically for this one. And what it would have to include uh, it, it really would just be label requirements that would have to be on the device itself, like don't point in your eyes when activated, that type of thing, but not really like, uh, you know, it has to be made out of certain materials or, or any of those. All of those certifications are already on the can that they use for this. So oh. it's, it's really about markings that would have to be on the product itself. Okay. Hey, Scott, what, what do you think? You sell products all day long. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. And, and first and foremost, uh, Darren and I last week spoke uh, in a forum about how to pitch a product. And I don't know, Ralph, whether you're on it or not. But one of the things we said there was that when people want to get a product, they're betting or maybe license or buy a product, they're betting on the horse and the jockey. And I would bet on both of you because you, you dressed the part today. You uh, it started the presentation with a nice courteous hello and thank you and all that. That instantly makes me like you and want to do business with you. So I want that as a supreme compliment because there are a lot of people who don't do that, and you did, and I appreciate that. Moving on now, uh, with the utmost deference to my good friend, Michael Miller, who has forgotten more about hardware stores and big box stores than I'll ever know, I slightly diverge from him. I actually think there might be a consumer play here. Um, I don't know much about testing, but I will say this. Mr. Miller is exactly right about the professional use. For example, uh, you know, ADT, Vector Security. I happen to have Vector. They came out three weeks ago, and part of our contract is to test our CO2. And also, I'm sure smoke detectors, all that. There is one in my house that's in a crawl space, and they had one hell of a time getting to it. So I absolutely see a need. I like it. But I got to tell you, in one of my rooms, too, I have, because I'm obsessed about this, I have a little uh, first alert pretty high up on a wall. If, if this was reasonably priced, I would absolutely talk myself into getting something that I could reach up, test the smoke alarm without doing the button. Because the button's always like, well, yeah, if it's hooked up to the battery, the button's going to work. But does the sensor itself actually work? So right. I actually think you might have something. I don't know a lot. It's a big box play. It's not a TV play. I don't think it might be. And I would consider it down the road once you're manufacturing. I really, really like the product. And it is one of the rare times 
where I would say very similar to what Mr. Miller said, I don't think there's a lot out there like it. So I really like it. And uh, I, I definitely like to catch up with you down the road. It's very interesting. Well, thank you. Appreciate thank it. That's pretty you big. Thank you. Thank yes, you very much. Thank, yeah, thank you so much, Ralph. Greatly appreciate the presentation. Okay, so we are going to move on to our next, which is Jay Sinet with the rational plunger. I didn't know there was a rational one. Mine feel, I guess mine's irrational. Irrational. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes where it goes. Go ahead, Jay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's wonderful to be in front of such tremendous uh, people. I uh, am an electronics engineer, but I spent 26 years, the last 26 years working at Michelin R&D and retired in 2012. Since then, I have had about 24 invention ideas, and this is the only one that has really, really, in my mind, gotten a gotten a lot of traction. So uh, this is what I'm presenting. Um, the, <laughs> to answer the question about rational, the current design of, of toilet plungers uses a flange that sticks down in the, the opening, but the majority of websites on how to use a plunger say to use suction instead of pressure. And if you know anything about design, sticking that flange down in there doesn't, it's not rational for using suction. So my plunger is rational, it uses a suction cup principle instead. And Carmine, if you could just go ahead and roll the video for me. The patented plunge clean with its sealing skirt is the most powerful and cleanest toilet plunger available. Here's how it works. You slowly compress the plunger all the way, then pull back sharply about two inches. As you will see, there is no splashing. This toilet is blocked with plywood, but is instrumented to measure the vacuum force. The force applied during this pull was greater than the best competitor on the market. The plunge clean cannot invert like many of the plungers on the market today where they trap filthy water that won't drain out. The plunge clean won't collapse on you. With its wide opening, the plunge clean is easy to clean. The plunge clean's wide skirt means it's universal, working even for toilets where standard plungers don't create a good seal. All the development work is done. I have pilot production pieces in my hands, and the factory is chomping at the bit to go into mass production. It can sell at prices comparable to other effective plungers and still have a comfortable price margin. Okay. And uh, one thing I know that's missing from my pitch is I didn't put in the contact information. I should have that scrolling on the, the last screen there where you're just looking at the static picture of the plunger. Um, that is on the cell sheet, but I didn't get it in on the pitch. There's one other feature that I didn't talk about on the cell sheet or in the video, and that is the handle. I designed the, the handle for this also and by gripping the handle, you have control. It, it encourages use in the suction mode, the pull mode, but it gives you good control over the orientation as compared to handles like these that either don't encourage the pull or they encourage the pull, but it's floppy. So uh, I think my handle's better designed too, but I don't have a patent on that. Uh, let's see, I'm an inventor, not an entrepreneur. So really what I'm looking to do is license this. I'll tell you the truth. I have already pitched it to uh, Lavelle Industries, which sells the Corky. And I've pitched it to um, Clorox, which has the brand of the, the uh, liquid plumber and gotten no success so far. But what I'm really looking for is a licensee to take it over. I'm old enough and don't have enough experience in entrepreneurship and so on. So I need to just get, get this in the hands of somebody else that'll take it and run with it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. So we're going to turn it on um, to turn on the mics for our um, judges for today. Let's start first with my friend Carmine. All right. Very good. Great, great pitch. I love the video. You've done a, a lot of work to this product. Um, you said that you're, you've manufactured, you, you currently have the mold, you own the tooling for this product? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, that's great. Uh, where, where are you doing this manufacturing? 
the, the manufacturing is actually done in China through a company in Ohio and Iowa. Uh, actually, technically, they own the materials. I have paid them, but uh, you know. No, it's okay. And what, what's the cost to, to manufacture? Not landed cost, but cost per unit, fully fully packaged. Well, the cost per unit to manufacture the plunger and the the handle is about four dollars. Now we got to add some cost for packaging and assembly because as it arrives FOB in Iowa, it's separate pieces and I, and I don't have a package for it. Okay. That's great. So, All right. Excellent. That's good. Very good. Awesome. Okay. Let's, let's hop up to our friend, Mike. Sure. Hey, uh, great presentation, Jay. I appreciate it. Uh, plungers, of course, being in the, being in the field of plumbing is is something that we look at quite often. Uh, the things that would be key for me specifically in your discussion there, you did talk about the different types of toilets. It it kind of doesn't quite jive though because the the base of your piece is actually a little bit. Uh, it's not as flexible as what it would need to be to really truly be fitting on most of the toilets. Uh, but I, that would just, you know, it's a technical question, but, uh, you know, possibly it'll be something we'll discuss later or something on that. Um, I could argue that, but. Uh... Okay, so it looked much more rigid in your, in your presentation, by the way. Um, it's good to see that it has that level of flexibility and maybe that would be something you might want to change in your presentation as well, because that's a, just an absolutely key element in these. Uh, your manufacturing costs are a bit high. That's actually the retail price for funders right now. Uh, so that is another one of the, the difficulties that you're probably going to need to, to overcome with this. But once again, if it's something that you can license to somebody, they can, they can work on that. I can show you a photograph I took three days ago at Home Depot of the Corky plunger for $14 on the shelf. So my estimate was that if, if mine, my plunger, which is superior to that, can sell for seven, mm -hmm. that you got a big margin there. Yeah, it's more expensive than what they sell their cheapest plunger for, but as a premium plunger, and I've, I've investigated the market, I've done the, the, tiers in the market and I really mm -hmm. think that there is a market for cheap there's a market for effective and there's a market for graceful <laughs> sure well, well let, sure. let's go to let's go to our wonderful friend Scott because he knows the market on pricing Scott he knows you, plungers you know, too plungers? yeah I've actually presented plungers on television and so good and bad here Jay um I get what you're going for and I and I like it and I like the idea that you have the science behind it you're clearly a smart guy um the problem in the plunger market is that you, as dumb as it sounds, you are swinging against heavyweights. And I mean heavyweights. The Reckitt Ben Keezers or the PNGs or the Quickies or the Cedaros, whoever, like all those big time companies. And it is really hard. So the idea that you want to license is 1000% spot on. In terms of television, the, plum, the plumbing apparatus that tends to work are the compression ones where you pump them or the ones that are worked off an aerosol can that explode the clog out. It's because it's the visual, that's all. It has nothing to do with efficacy. It's just a pure visual of television. Or like a green gobbler where you pour the powder down or like Professor Amos where it unclogs the drain. So unfortunately in your situation, I don't think you're right for TV, but I would absolutely talk to a quickie. I would talk to one of those kind of to see if you can incorporate it in it may not be quite as lucrative for you, but they're the ones who can handle it. Trying to swing against them is exceptionally difficult. But of the three of us on the panel, uh, Mr. Miller is the one for sure that would know the most about that because he lives and eats and breathes this every day. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Great. We've got to move on to our next one. Um, thank you so much, Jay. And now I understand why it's the rational plunger. <laughs> got that. All right, so we're moving on to Kirk Kleb. Kurt, want to make sure that you are there. I, I love that this is the new stick. I, I, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure I must have an old stick someplace, but I love that there's going to be a new one. So, can you hear me? Kurt, yes, we can hear you. Take away yeah. with your new stick. Hi, everybody. My name is Kurt, and uh, for sure I want to uh, thank you all for this opportunity, and I really appreciate your time. 
Um, I am the inventor and patent holder of the new stick. I invented and um, I invented a new way to cook around the campfire hot dogs and marshmallows. This is an old stick and I took and rotisserized this old stick to make it look something like this. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but this is the new stick. Wow. And Carmen, could you play my video that I sent you guys? And it'll kind of show you the bottom of the everybody burning their hot dogs and their marshmallows and just not ending up with a good product and I decided to fix that and that's what I did in in the designing the new stick I patented the 90 degree angle where the only product on the market that has that 90 degree angle I am currently working with a design company to get the drive mechanism internal clean it up a little bit it's kind of expensive um, so I this is, I don't know, again, if you can see this, but this is a very rough prototype of that internal drive. Um, <laughs> it's really long. Looks like you're fishing there, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's exactly what it does. Is it's, it's a fishing. This is the marshmallow. This is the marshmallow uh, attachment right here that holds the marshmallows. We are the only product out there that lets you cook Jiffy Pop by the campfire. And that's with this attachment right here that goes on to uh, the new stick that goes in and now it spins. So people are loving being able to cook popcorn by the campfire. A market I didn't realize was the backyard patio campfire. I didn't realize it was as big as it is. People are having a lot of fun cooking marshmallows um, and, and the Jiffy Pop again out on their patio church groups. It's, it's just uh, really been an amazing discovery for me to, to see them uh, enjoy this. But the, the product works so well, it cooks marshmallows to a point where they literally the size of small, small oranges. And, and lots of times marshmallows end up looking like this. I, again, I don't know if you can see that, but that's a typical mm -hmm. marshmallow around a campfire, you know, just with half of it burnt. And when you're cooking with the new stick, it ends up, they look like that. Wow. So anyway, it works really well. Um, I would love to get it licensed. I'm not the business guy to go out and do it. I would just like to license the patent and um, let somebody take it away and, and make it, you know, we're working on the market ready, but I, you know, whoever takes it over, they might want to do their own market ready. So I'm not sure how far to push that and how far to take that. <laughs> um, okay. How much to spend, how much to spend on that? Time. Time. Right. Time out. We are, we're moving because I, I can tell my friend Scott is antsy to give some feedback. <laughs> Go, my friend Scott. Um, no, so uh, a great presentation, great video. I love the video. God gets right to it, shows you what it does. I, I like the product. There's a reason I'm only shooting this high up because I enjoy hot dogs and s'mores, and I don't need the whole world to see that. So I instantly get what your product does. Um, I think there's a couple of ba uh, barriers to overcome. It looks like it's very well engineered, but it may be engineered to a point where it may be too expensive for what the consumer is willing to pay. Um, I don't know that for sure, and that's not a discussion for right now, but you have to engineer a certain way so it, it's fire resistant, but if it's over-engineered to the point of being too expensive, you, you, you've got that. 
And then the other thing is, I don't know how, in terms of television only, I don't know how big of a problem it solves um, in terms of how painful that problem is, whether uh, to use Jordan Pine's great analysis, whether it's an itch or it's in a heart attack uh, in terms of the pain scale. So uh, in terms of television, it's real demonstrable, great video, uh, but I would be worried about price of engineering and just how big of a demographic it actually covers. So, but that's not to say you can't make money at maybe like an REI or some sort of outdoor world, that kind of a thing. Really good product. Right, awesome. thank you. Perfect. Carmine, what do you think? Yeah, Scott, you're right on. This is my question too. Um, Kurt, awesome, awesome presentation. I was getting hungry just watching the video. The problem that I saw was when you said you wanted to license, I think you're, I think you're solving too many of the problems if you want to license uh, because the, the company that takes it on is going to do a lot of the work that you might not have. Um, so I think that if you need to start working on a licensing um, project right now, licensing deal right now, don't spend so much time and money on it, perfecting it because the company may not want to perfect it the way you did. Uh, I like the idea, but I, I agree with Scott. I just don't know how big of a market. Part of the fun for me is sending the kids out into the woods and getting a stick. So I don't know. I, 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 I just don't know how big the market is, but no, I'm hoping that you've done some surveys on it. <laughs> well, I definitely have. And like I said, I watched 14 people around a campfire, every one of them burning their hot dogs and marshmallows. So that was a problem I solved and sure. I solved it really well. So let me show it, let me throw it over to Mike really quickly, about 45 seconds. I want to get his feedback because he's in this hardware space and world. Mike? Uh, I absolutely have to agree with uh, some of the comments that Scott said. Uh, really uh, over-engineered tremendously. But then the second version that you showed looked to me like where you've started working with this design company, they might be coming up with something that uh, might possibly be able to be produced at a much lower cost. I think the other thing that you need to really focus on, just like you did with the Jiffy Pop thing, is some unique features of ways of cooking food that make this totally different than you spinning a stick. And I think you need to look at that area a little bit closer. You know, is there a different configuration of the head or the way that it attaches to food, that type of thing? Um, I think there needs to be something there to give it a little bit more pizzazz, basically, and make it even that much more unique that you can really show people, look, here's what it looks like doing a chicken breast on this, a stick. This is what it looks like using your product, right? Uh, I think those types of things would really overcome some of the obstacles that Scott was talking about. Uh, but really good product, though. I, I like where you're going with this. Some of my two minute and two and a half minute video shows that a lot better than that little short one minute video that I had to put together, so. Yeah, well, that was great. It was a great product. Thank I think that the bottom line is that people see that there's a use for it. Now we just gotta make sure that it can get in the hands of all the consumers with the right pricing. All right, so let's move on to our next presenter. And again, just, uh, just commentating really quickly, we are so honored that we could be part of the hardware shows first virtual Zoom pitch panel. We had one yesterday, we have it again today. Um, we have so many people that are on and are watching. This is so exciting. And we just, we love the UIA's partnership and collaboration with the Hardware Show. They are an amazing organization that is constantly trying to think of how can we help Small Business USA grow and continue to, to spread the information about their products. So we are just honored as part of the UIA to be part of this Hardware Show virtual pitch session. So let's move on to our next presenter and that is Michael Estridge with the Unstrapinator. I feel like you should be saying I'll be back or something, I don't know, <laughs> but take it away, Michael. You're muted, Mike. Here, I will unmute him. Hang on, I, I can. I'm trying to unmute him. Oh yeah, we all are. How's that? There we go, perfect, yeah. go ahead. So first off, thanks everybody for the opportunity. It's great. My name is Mike Eskridge with the veteran owned and operated Fixed It LLC here in Arizona. And I'm here to present the new Pat and Pinning Unstrapinator tool for ratchet straps. It's the world's first and only tool for getting them loose. So first off, you might ask, what is a ratchet strap? I've got some here on the wall. 
and they come in all different shapes, sizes, colors, are made all over the world, used all over the world, every day by thousands of people. They use them for hauling things, securing cargo, things like ATVs, motorcycles, boats, kayaks, RVs. In the commercial industry, they use them in the military every day, trucking, landscaping, hauling appliances, running to the dump, you name it. As a matter of fact, I challenge you when you get outside again, hopefully you get back outside thanks to COVID, you know, look around at people hauling stuff and you'd be really hard pressed to not see somebody using ratchet straps for something because they use them for everything. And they are a great tool. And the way that they work is you hook each end into whatever you're gonna fasten it to and then you ratchet and close. That's great. Nice secure way to secure your cargo. The problem is they have this great handle for getting them tight, but no method to get them loose. So what people do is they open the ratchet and have to tug on them to get them loose, if you're lucky enough to get them loose. And that's if you have the grip strength. You've got arthritis or carpal tunnel, or you just don't want to fight with your straps. A lot of people cut them off and throw them away. So you've got to go buy more. If you don't do that, a lot of people's go-to is the flat blade screwdriver, which kind of works. It fits into the slot on the side of it. However, there's this great big pin in the way, so you really can't hook into it. And your screwdriver slips. What happens when it slips? You poke yourself. We've talked to a lot of people now that we've got these out in the field a bit, and there are people having to go get stitches from jabbing themselves with screwdrivers and other tools. If you don't stab yourself, you might scratch or dent your cargo. What you don't want to do is scratch your fancy motorcycle or your refrigerator that you're hauling home, anything that you're hauling. So you might ask, how big of a problem is this? Well, I went on to Google this morning and just typed, how to unreadably scratch it straps. And I got 36.6 million results. So this is a big issue and people are fighting with it every day. So the advantage of the unstrapinator with its pack pinning design is it's specifically made to fit into the side of those straps and over the pin. And it fits in very securely. And it's a good, tight, safe fit. Not only that, it has a zero and 90 degree end. So if you're in a tight space, like say you're using a car hauler and it's on the wheel wells where a screwdriver won't fit, you can spin it around, use the other end, and you're able to get it loose. So you're not going to get stuck trying to get it undone. The big advantages are, number one, safety. You're not going to have to go get stitches. You're not going to damage your cargo by scratching or denting it. It's going to save you money by not paying for doctor bills or repairing your stuff, and by not having to cut them off and replace them when they get stuck. It also saves you a lot of time and frustration. Anybody who's used ratchet straps on a regular basis, like myself, uh, you've been known to swear and cuss and throw them across the room because they are not fun to fight with. Uh, and again, it has the zero and 90 degree end to help get that out. The other advantage of these is that they're small. Uh, we do have a larger one for the commercial industry that we're working on, but for the average user, this 304 stainless version fits in your pocket, glove box, toolbox. It's a great point of sale item. It ships really easy because it's small and it's a great gift. Uh, it's currently 100% made in America, including the stainless steel. Uh, because we're a veteran-owned company, Made in America is very important to us, and that is the unstrapinator. Our tagline is get loose and get moving. So I'd love ah, to hear your thoughts. Awesome, and right on cue. Excellent. I did practice. Okay, <laughs> let's start first with Michael. What are your thoughts about the unstrapinator? Well, Mike, I uh, good presentation. Uh, uh, probably the only thing I would say negative about the presentation is that the distance that you are away from the camera makes it extremely difficult to see the, the actual attachment method of the strap. But I did watch your video prior to the presentation here, and I like the way that it fits, form, function, uh, probably the cost. I mean, uh, you know, just looking at it, you can, you know how much it would cost to manufacture this. Uh, so I, I uh, the only thing you didn't mention is from the IP perspective, where are you at with it? Is it an issued patent or? It's a utility patent and it's patent pending, filed in, in January. Okay, not a design patent, but a utility patent? Correct. Okay, very good. Uh, that's exactly where it needs to be. And uh, But yeah, I, and especially with so many people buying RVs right now, which are <laughs> going sure. totally crazy. Anybody who has an RV, uh, it's probably a lot of people's first exposure to using these types of straps. And so I could see a real big market for that. So really well, good luck to you and uh, hope to be talking to you about this product as well afterwards. Thanks, and, and to your point about being a little further away, we debated that and having some samples. 
Uh, and the reason we decided this was okay is because actually in the next segment, our video runs in the inventor spotlight where it has close up. So I, I kind of had to toss back and forth to get, get close up and I thought it would be okay because in the next segment, there are some really good close ups of it as well. Okay, we have just enough time to give Scott a few sound bites and then Carmen, Carmen will have you kind of wrap this one up. So go ahead, Scott. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for your service. You know, none of us could do what we do if it weren't for it or your willingness to risk your lives for our freedoms. Michael Miller is also a veteran. And we're always deeply appreciative. Um, for me, real quick, it just wouldn't work in my world. It's what's called a presumptive sell, meaning you have to presume that the buyer already owns the product, which it makes better. In our world of television, there aren't enough people that would own ratchet straps to make it a viable television product. That said, I, I think there's absolutely a market for it. And I think it could work the trucking industry to a lot of others. Again, Michael Miller would be the guy to, to talk to you about that because he deals more in that area than what I would. Not that it isn't a good product. It is just wouldn't be a television product. That's all. Oh, thanks so much. And then Carmine, some uh, fi final words here as we're just about yeah, over. Real, thank, thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, great, great presentation, Mike. Uh, real quick, for, um, are you looking to license this product or are you looking to sell it into retail? Well, we, right now we, we are set up for retail. We do have packaging, uh, but I wouldn't... I wouldn't turn away and offer to discuss licensing. Great, great. What's your what's your price point right now? Right now we sell them for twenty dollars online, free shipping because uh, we're a veteran. It's free shipping in the USA or any military post office in the world. Awesome. How many have you sold so far? Well, we sold about forty, but we've spent most of our time getting them in the hands of people to test them. Uh, we just left the UTV World Championships up in Lake Havasu. Lots of great feedback from people hauling UTVs and motorcycles and trucking. Uh, so we've really been trying to get the feedback first. We're just breaking into the market, not in the yeah. story. No, it's awesome. Great job. I think you're doing exactly what you should be with that particular product. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit after this. Go ahead, Dara. Awesome. Thank you so much, Unstrapinator. Wonderful job. Yeah. All right. Hey, Dara. Hey, Dara. Yeah. Yes. I'm so unbelievably sorry, but my daughter is a senior at Conestoga High School here in Paoli, Pennsylvania, and it is her final season of field hockey. She has a game, and I promised I would not miss a minute. So I must go. Thank you all. Great seeing all of you guys. Hope to there see you soon. There you go. Absolutely. No problem. I'll be Thanks, taking Scott. Take care, guys. Thanks, Scott. Be good. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Awesome. So once again, if you're just joining us, and we've had so many people that are coming in and watching and listening, and hopefully you all are learning. We're just so excited that we are here as part of the UIA and the hardware show, the hardware show unfortunately had to go virtual this year, but just like they, they do every year, they're cutting edge, they are, on, they are on point to make sure that they can still bring the hardware show and that they can still make connections. So we are so thrilled to be partnering with the hardware show once again, to bring you amazing entrepreneurs and to give them the opportunity to pitch in front of our panel. So we hopefully now have Steve. Steve, I think, uh, can you see us, Steve? <laughs> I, I know, I still see Unstrapinator on there. I see me. <laughs> Steve's, uh, Steve, your internet's probably just lagging a little bit. I think that, um, sorry, uh, Dara, do you think I should just run his video? Yeah, so Steve, here's what we'd like to do, if you're okay. Let us run your video. I will give you then a minute or so. Hopefully, maybe you can hear it. If not, I'll let you know when it's over, but we can see it. So let us run your video so that we get an understanding of what your product is, okay? Okay, and then you'll talk to me afterwards. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead, Carmine. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present. When they first go in, but after years, this is what you get. Put in plaster like this, concrete, and not covering the entire surface, it doesn't do any good. The water's getting in, it's lifting the cement. Here you have a problem. Doc Woods' badass mud will solve the problem. In a perfect world, I'd coat this log with mud and then cut about a half inch off, and then I could see a cross section to show you the strength of badass mud. But since I can't, I took this four x four, sliced it deep enough, tried to get a very close simulation, and I will fill that with the mud, and then tomorrow we will cross cut that and stress test it. Now I'm gonna cut that sample we filled yesterday, flex test it, Pretty good, very good. Now that we see how strong it is, how good it is, I'm gonna show you an application. First of all, I take a wire brush and clean all the loose debris. And there might be a nail or there might be somebody I got something I gotta knock out. 
Then I take my dust gun and blow it off so I get rid of all the debris. Now I like to spray a little water on to keep the wood from drawing the moisture from my mud. Now we're going to mix our parts. Everything's pre-measured with our measuring cups. I'm going to mix that up like everything. you got to mix it really, really good. It's like frosting. Now here we are. We're going to frost the cake. I'm shoving it deeply into the grain. Very hard. A lot of pressure pushing it in there. It's very creamy, like a frosting. In fact, it looks like a cake, doesn't it? Let's move that out. Never. I can't help but have a few air holes that pop up the next day, so we're going to put a little mud away for tomorrow. Oh yeah, just a little bit here. I'm going to rub it in with my finger. Real easy to wash off with soap and water. And we're done. How many other uses can you think of for badass mud? Hello there. Here we are a year later. A year and five days since we did this post in the video. And look how it still holds up. Not a problem, not a crack. No. And you remember this guy? Remember when we first did the video, he flexed. He don't want to move too much now. He's pretty he's pretty tight. He's pretty solid. And this is a piece I put in the freezer on 9-4. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Doc Woods badass mud. Now here's another post I did last year. And I went right over the cement with this one. I want to see how it would hold. I see no movement, no cracking where they're blending. It's it's held. It's beautiful. I was standing out here on a busy highway. Wow. That is great. Oh my gosh. Are you are you with us? Are you still with us, Steve? Show the money shot. You missed the you need to show the rest of the video. Well, <laughs> Okay, we, but that's good enough. We're out of time. Yeah, no, I think we, we absolutely get it. The money shot to me, uh, and oh, I'll, sorry. <laughs> I'll jump in there. The money shot to me was when you, in our world, te even television retail that I have been in and traditional retail, when you can do what they call a B&A, which is a before and after, that sells itself typically. And the fact that you did your B&A for one year, I mean, that was that was dynamic. I think that we fully understand what the product is and maybe what we can do is jump into asking you some specific questions i'll just ask you a few to start with the first is do you have a patent on your mud formula and then how much do does one container retail for steve uh i do have patent pending i have no idea I don't know what it's going to cost. I haven't manufactured it. To me, I buy in two components. I modify them. And then we have our mud and our binder. Wow. And so the only other solution that you've seen has been the concrete, pouring of the concrete on it to kind of help settle it. Yeah, or similar. Okay. And I'm curious because this isn't my world. I can't wait for Michael to jump in because Michael is like the hands-on kind of a guy. But... Why do people need to use the mud on the top of those spokes? What would happen if they didn't use the mud? It would just separate a little bit more, but it would still stay intact, wouldn't it? Eventually it'll rot away. I, I've seen logs with six inches of, of center missing. Okay. And the, like I said, the money shot that wasn't there is the uh, uh, road traffic barriers, all those wood wooden blocks along the highway that are just rotting away before our very eyes. There's billions of them in this country and they wow. need Doc Woods badass mud. Boy, they do. Wow. Okay. I mean, that, that, that is fascinating. I've never seen a product work like that as well as it worked like that in the video. So I'm so glad we got to see the video and hear the video. Mike, go ahead. Take this away. Sure. Thank you. Well, I think it's a great product. Um, and I like the demo that you did. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about a lot with the different people that are presented here is sort of showing people what's the worst case if you don't use this product. So 
I, I realize the market that you're going after, which is to replace concrete, which it looks like a really, really excellent product to replace that. But what you need to be able to show people is sort of that cross section of, uh, you know, one of those posts. And then what's the cost of replacing one of those posts if you don't use this product? Uh, because as we all know who do these types of posts, you have to go and dig them out. They've got to be dug out. You got to dig the new hole. You got to put the new post in. Uh, it's it's not a small small job to replace one of these, and costing hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars, especially for talking uh, near salt water and things like that. And that's actually one of my questions for you. How does this work with salt water? Since these types of posts are traditionally used in docks, both in lakes, but also near salt water as well. I am near the salt water. I am at the beach. There's the harbor right out there. I am, I'm at the beach. And what you didn't get to see in the video is there's 42 posts that were locked in sidewalk. So you had to take the sidewalk out to change the posts. <laughs> so you're really looking exactly. at a lot of money. <laughs> But this will save it. Stop the rot. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. All right, Carmine. The best post protection product on the planet. Hey, um, real quick, Stephen. Um, uh, one, what are you looking for in this product? Are you looking to license it or, or sell it yourself? What are you looking to do? Uh, license it. Okay. If I was uh, 10 years younger, I'd make it. I'd great, manufacture so. it, but I don't... So is there any other applications for this product except for those type of posts? I've tried it on several, but this is, this is big enough. This, there's nothing that works now. And, and I guess product on the planet. Uh, maybe to put some words into his mouth. Yes, there would be a, quite a few other applications. <laughs> yeah. For the yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. But oh, I mean, post, yeah, that is great. Steve, thank you so very much for your time. I think our head is spinning thinking about what else we could use the mud for. Oh, yeah. um, and again, once again, big, huge kudos to you for your B&As, for your before and after. It sold the story. So thank you so very much for that. So our final presenter, unfortunately, has not made it. However, he did send a video. I think he got a little confused maybe with the time zones of when we were doing the pitch session, but he had sent us a video. And out of courtesy and respect for him, if you all are okay, we would like to show his video to get an understanding of his product. And then I'm going to hit each of the different um, judges and ask them to give at least just about one minute worth of feedback because Carmine is taping this and we'd like to be able to turn this over and get it back to Bill. So he at least can see that we gave him time and gave him some feedback. So Carmine, are you able to go ahead and run the video for the safety three wheel wheelbarrow? I am, just tell me when. When. Tired of your wheelbarrow pushing you around? Try our wheelbarrow for one week and you will never return to your one-wheeled wheelbarrow again. When you count on Miracle Wheelbarrows, LLC. We're passionate about our work and will ensure that quality is maintained. If you want a wheelbarrow with additional safety features that'll help you work at night as well, the Ultra Wheelbarrow is your best option. Call Miracle Wheelbarrows, LLC today to see which option is right for you and your work. Nice. Wow. Wonderful. All right, Scott. Uh, Scott, I'm here, sorry. I was saying Scott, I'm seeing a different Scott. So Mike, go ahead and talk to us about the wheelbarrow. I think that we have seen this before at the hardware show, uh, but go ahead. What, do you, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, you're right. Uh, although I'm not sure it's this particular version. Um, and so that's what's kind of a little bit confusing about this when there's uh, a couple of these that are modifications to current wheelbarrows, and then there's a couple that are from the ground up, a completely different type of wheelbarrow, and each of them have different uh, features, benefits, and also patentability, and so that would be really some of the questions I would have about this. I mean, uh, you can look at it and tell that it would be easier to use, probably safer, be able to carry more weight, those types of things. But the key in these is really what is the IP 
that surrounds this particular product? And how does it differ from, like you noted, I mean, we've seen in a couple of these different versions just over the last uh, probably five years at the hardware show, uh, is really understanding what those differences might be. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, that's a really good point to talk to entrepreneurs about, which is when you are developing a product, do the research, make sure that there is nothing that's out there that's competitive, or if there is, because at some point, unless you're the new iPhone, or you're inventing the first car that's going to float in space, most of everything has been somewhat invented and, and all you're doing is taking it and tweaking it and making it a little bit better for the end user. So I strongly suggest everyone to do their research because one of the big questions that I normally ask when I'm in front of a lot of entrepreneurs is who is your competitor? Tell me about your competitor and then why is yours different? And that's really where you need to focus on what those benefits yeah. are as to why. Yeah, absolutely. And product. that's why both of us like that previous video. Yes, exactly. Because we're like. It was the concrete <laughs> there. You don't even have to know anything about post. You just see concrete. This obviously better. Okay. I got it. Right. Yeah. It's, I'm thinking wooden playground. Tip of the hat. You know, and what can you use that for? So yeah. just again, encouraging entrepreneurs to make sure that they do the research and see if there's somebody else that's out there because there are several, um, there's Triwill, there's um, another one, there's another company that's out there. I was just trying to literally find the other company's name that's out there, TK, Triwill. They're, they're out there that have this three system. So just really focus on, especially if that video is being used to go out there into the marketplace, focus on telling me why your three wheel vehicle, your wheelbarrow is different from others that people might have seen. Because you also yeah. don't want yours to be confused with somebody else. If somebody wants to get a three wheel and they think, I saw this really cool video, it's great. And then they go and they happen to go to their local hardware store and see one. If there was something different about yours, you'd have to make sure that you articulated that or else you could lose the sale because the, because the products are a little bit maybe too competitive. So yeah. that's my feedback. I'm going to turn it over to Carmine, who hopefully can give some final feedback and then kind of wrap us up for, for this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with uh, you, Michael and, and Dara, 100%, especially in this type of market where you're building such a big product, you really have to know what your differential is on the product, who your market is, and if you can actually target that particular person, because as you know, Dara, Michael, if I have a wheelbarrow, I have to have a pretty good reason not only to get rid of the wheelbarrow I have, and now to have a new one as Michael and Dara said. So, so there's a lot to talk about. Just because you come up with that better product, there has to be a reason that we're going to switch over to it. Because what bothers me might not be big enough of an issue <laughs> to buy another product. So, you know, it, it's a lot to do when you're building this type of product. I love the, the industry, the market, because it's wide open, but you really, really got to know who your market is and target them very quickly and give a good enough price point to warrant switching over. What do you guys do you kind of think of that? Yeah. 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 So. I totally agree. And you're right. That big type of a product, because there's so many things you have to think about as well. It's not just the size of it, but where it's going to go on somebody's shelf. <laughs> Kathy has something she wants to say. Only because I talked to Bill so many times. So one of the things, the bonuses of the wheelbarrow is that you don't have to lift it to push it around because you basically just push it. It's got a handlebar at the top. So that to me is very- oh, wow. So it's like, a, that's a cart. Yeah. Like a cart and more for dexterity. Exactly. Yeah. Great benefit. See, something like yeah. that that we didn't quite see in the video. So again, if people use those videos or those sell sheets to communicate out to retailers, you got to make sure you put everything, including the kitchen sink inside of that. <laughs> well, and you know, and I you think know, that's Dar a key point too, Kathy, is that, you know, when you're inventing these things, and I know even myself with products I've invented or products that I've worked with with our engineering team, you get so close to it that things that are just so absolutely obvious to you, you need to make sure that it's also obvious to your audience whenever you go to present it. Because you overlook it because it just, how could you not know that? But the reality is people don't know that. And you need to really make sure that you point those key areas out. Yeah, no doubt. 
no doubt about it. But, you know, that's what's so great about what we're doing, what the education is. These these shows, the different shows that the OA puts on, uh, National Hardware Show, you know, sponsored by Reed Exposition, you know, doing this is really giving everyone that information. I mean, just that little bit watching the video and realizing that, hey, I didn't say that you just push it around. That's huge to me. So so uh, if you're going to have a video, make sure you hit all those points. I mean, that's the biggest thing. So. Yeah. And, and even Jay had said, well, oh, this wasn't included on my sell sheet, right, Jay? Remember that? So it's yeah. like, oh, shoot, let me go put it on my sell sheet. Because if that you get that one chance in front of somebody, you want to make sure that it's all there. Correct. Well, Carmine, take us out of here. And, and again, thank you all. Thank you for allowing me to be the moderator. And thank you for allowing me to try to keep everybody on, on task. And I really greatly appreciate Kathy for working so hard to pull everything together. Thank you, Mike Miller, for, our, for incredible feedback that you've given. Carmine, as always, you're the best radio DJ host that's out there. I tell everybody I would rather watch you on Sunday morning sometimes than other people. You're fantastic. And Reed Expo and the and the National Hardware Show, I I just have to tell you, bar none, they're probably one of my most favorite trade shows that they've ever put on. And for them to be able to work and put this on is first class because their first thought was how are we going to make sure that we care about our entrepreneurs. So I um, just want to give a shout awesome. out to them. But Carmine, awesome. Rastafari. Awesome, Dara. Great. Excellent job narr narrating this show. It was Even though we had some issues, you worked right through them. It was so much fun. And we always have fun doing this. This isn't uh, you know, heart surgery. We get to have fun. We get to see products. And this is what we love to do. I thank to all of our presenters. They all did a great job working so hard and jumping in there. Kathy, Dara, Michael. And uh, you know, we won't tell Scott that we didn't say anything about him. But all such, such a great job. We thank everyone. National Hardware Show, Reed Expo. Great job. And also an this particular recording will be available on the UIA TV YouTube channel. Go on out there. You can watch it. If you want to get a copy of it, please get in touch with Kathy and we will send you out a copy. Thank you everyone today for participating and we will catch you next time on UIA.